Well, thank you very much for having me here. I'm really excited to have this opportunity to speak with you today. It's my first time here in Santiago, so uh, I'm also excited to explore the area. Um, I work for an international nonprofit organization directing our global efforts around the world to try to reduce methane emissions, as you were just hearing about methane uh, from the, um, the announcers there. Um, I've spent the last 25 years of my life working on climate change and the energy transition. Prior to that, I worked in the US Congress, and before that, I was doing development work in Central Africa. Climate change, if you've studied it at all, is not the most uplifting subject to study. It's actually quite depressing a lot of times. But I'm here to talk about hope and uh, to deliver a message that we can deal with climate change in our lifetimes. But let's start first with the depressing stuff. So climate change is all around us. It's here today. And what was supposed to slowly start impacting us over this century has dramatically accelerated in the last decade. Almost every year is announced as the hottest year yet, and 2023 is one of those. It's the hottest year on record. And the last eight years are the hottest eight years ever. Droughts, floods, fires, melting glaciers, rising sea levels, overheated oceans, powerful superstorms. All of these are wreaking havoc on our planet and impacting people's health and livelihoods. We have known about this problem for a long time, but we so far have failed to change the trajectory of those temperatures or emissions. This is largely because emissions have continued to grow despite all our efforts. This is CO2 emissions here, going back to pre-industrial levels we were at about 275 parts per million in the atmosphere. We're now at about 425 parts per million. I believe this is due to two problems in the climate space. One is a physical one, and two is a psychological one. The physical problem is that our society globally has become completely and totally addicted to fossil fuels. It becomes it's part of literally everything we do. It's part of our materials, it's part of our energy, and getting that out of the system is really difficult to do in certain places, and it's really expensive. The psychological problem is that everything we do to reduce CO2 emissions, like buying solar power for our homes or driving an electric car, the climate benefits won't be seen by those of us here in the room. And that's because when you emit a molecule of CO2, that molecule is impacting the climate for hundreds and hundreds of years. So everything we do to reduce emissions now takes a really long time to see an impact on climate. Ooh, I went too far, there we go. Um, and this leads to one last psychological problem, despair. When you go around working on climate change, a lot of people have become um, very despondent about climate. They don't feel like we can do anything to solve the problem. But this takes pressure off of policymakers. It takes pressure off of companies. It takes pressure off the, the global community to take action. When we no longer care about it because we're despondent about it, it takes the pressure off the people that have to take the actions that are necessary. But there is hope. In 2000, a study was published by James Hansen looking at non-CO2 climate pollutants and their impact on temperature. The study documented for the very first time the hope that we can bend that curve on temperature, that we can start to bring it down. These pollutants, HFCs, ozone, black carbon, and methane, are known by a couple of names that describe how they impact the climate. Super pollutants or short-lived climate pollutants. 
And this is because they are really powerful at impacting the climate, but they only have a very short life in the atmosphere, usually only a couple of decades, unlike CO2. Methane, for instance, is about 80 times more powerful than CO2 when it's warming the planet, but it only lasts for about 12 years in the atmosphere. Methane emissions have also been going up, uh, quite dramatically, actually, from 700 parts per billion pre-industrial levels to 1,925 parts per billion now. And this is leading to big climate impacts. Methane is actually responsible for about half the warming we're feeling today. So about a half a degree of centigrade is, responsible, is due to methane pollution. But this high impact, very short life in the atmosphere, allows us to have a big impact in changing climate if we can do something to reduce methane emissions. And that's the other good news here. Methane emission reductions is readily doable. The things that we need to do to achieve reductions, we've got the technologies to do that. We've got the technology right now today to reduce the warming of the planet by 0.3 degrees Celsius. 0.3 doesn't sound like a whole lot, but remember when we've warmed about 1.1, 0.3 is a massive impact. Nothing new has to be created. Most of the technologies are either profitable or cheap to deploy. So one pollutant offers us a pathway to deal with our physical problem and our two psychological problems of climate change. And we can start to bend the curve on climate change in our lifetimes and set ourselves on the right path to tackling the rest of climate problem. So let's talk a little bit more about where methane comes from. The energy sector is responsible for about 36% of human-related methane emissions. It comes from the production of oil, gas, and coal. In the oil and gas sector, emissions come from the entire supply chain, from the, the wellhead all the way down to your home. It leaks, it's intentionally vented out of the um, system. Um, it's pervasive throughout the system. But there are a lot of solutions that re can reduce methane emissions in the oil and gas sector for about, by about 80%. And these are things, it's more like plumbing than rocket science here. You have to fix valves and tighten pipes and things like that, but it's not complicated actions, but it does require government intervention to achieve this. And in the past few years, we've seen a number of countries take on this action around the world. Uh, but what we need is more countries to make this uh, pervasive throughout the world. In the coal sector, there's a large amount of methane that's uh, usually contained within the coal. And so when we mine coal, we release that methane into the atmosphere. But up to 98% of that methane can be mitigated through low cost systems that either drain the methane from the coal seam ahead of time or by capturing the methane that comes out of the mine shaft um, before it gets into the atmosphere. Livestock production is responsible for about 32% of human-made methane emissions, with about 80% of it coming essentially from cow burps, also known as enteric fermentation, and 20% from manure management. Technologies to reduce livestock emissions are still being developed, but there's a lot of promise with things like feed additives and biodigesters for uh, manure management. And then there's other things like breeding low methane cows and finding vaccines for methane in cows. Those are still in the early stages. But the good news is there's a lot of appetite for the development of these and there's a lot of money going in to support new solutions. The waste sector is responsible for about 19% of methane emissions. The majority of waste comes from emissions it at a landfill from organic waste that we send to that landfill. So every time you send an apple core or anything else like that to a landfill, it creates methane in the landfill. In 2020, we created 2.24 billion metric tons of municipal solid waste in the world. And that's expected to grow by 70% by 2050. And globally organic waste the stuff that makes the methane, makes up about 60% of our municipal waste. But there's technologies that can cut all of that by about 80%, and 60% of the reductions can be done at low or no cost. 
These include things like food waste prevention, organics diversion, so instead of sending the apple core to the landfill, we send it to be composted. Things like this can dramatically have an impact on, uh, on emissions within the waste sector. Rice production is the last source. It's responsible for about 8% of methane emissions, which comes from the flooded fields and microbial decay that happens in the soil when you flood them. Reducing emissions from rice can be a bit challenging because there's all sorts of cultural aspects associated with those flooded fields in certain parts of the world. Um, and there can be some productivity loss, but we're seeing a lot of promising solutions with soil amendments and water management, as well as um, an opportunity for new varieties of rice that use a lot less water. Chile has been playing a leading role in the waste sector in mitigating emissions in the waste sector. Back in 2020, Chile published a national organic waste strategy that seeks to improve the management of the waste sector emissions and reduce pollution. The strategy was developed in partnership with the Canadian government and seeks to recover 66% of the municipal organic waste that's by 2040. Replicating what Chile is doing here has become the goal of the international community around the world, trying to get other countries to take on what Chile is trying to do right now. But one of the problems we've had with all of this is that with methane, we can't see it and we can't smell it. It's invisible and it's odorless. So it's really difficult. It's not like a smokestack on a power plant where you see the pollution coming out the stack. You can have a gas facility that's leaking methane right out the stack and you won't ever see it without special technologies. But there's been major advancements in technology around the world with satellites uh, that are now able to see large methane emission sources around the world. And these space-based instruments combined with sensors on drones and airplanes and on the ground are building an infrastructure that allows us to finally start to really get a good view of how much methane is coming out and where we need to take action. We're already seeing results. It seems like every day, we see new reports of major methane emission release events detected by these satellites. And in 2024, we're gonna see the launch of several new satellites that's only gonna increase our awareness of this. The map here shows emissions from landfills have been detected by just two of the satellites that are currently available. And if we zoom in, you can see one of these sites, this is in Buenos Aires, um, where you see a landfill that's leaking a lot of methane emissions. But we need action that starts to eliminate these emissions, and thankfully, we're seeing a lot of growth there. Three years ago at COP26 in Glasgow, the Global Methane Pledge was launched with the objective of cutting methane by 30% by 2030. Since then, 155 countries have joined, and we are witnessing the creation of an entire ecosystem dedicated to reducing methane emissions. Over $1 billion in new grant funding has been raised, 3.5 billion in new investments from multilateral development banks and a ton of other work. We've seen a number of countries put forth new policies for oil and gas, also for waste, and we're seeing big investments to find new solutions to reduce methane emissions from the, uh, the agriculture sector, especially from enteric fermentation. In fact, there's an organization based here in Chile called the Global Methane Hub that is supporting a massive investment into finding new technical solutions for enteric fermentation. Again, cow burps. Another global initiative that's been launched is one to target the waste sector uh, to try to reduce 1 million metric tons of methane annually. And this is set to unlock about 10 billion in public and private investment. The Inter-American Development Bank has also launched a project here in Latin America and the Caribbean that's already put $372 million into several projects here in the region. This progress gives me hope but it must be just the start. It's wonderful to have all these kinds of announcements uh, about what we're gonna do to address methane and the money that we're bringing forward, but unless these things are fully emptied, implemented, we're not gonna see the kind of progress that's necessary and we will fail to take advantage 
of the opportunity that methane presents us, and that's to finally start to bend that curve on climate change in our lifetime. I thank you for your time, and I wish you a wonderful Congreso del Futuro.